Hello and welcome to the webinar. For those of you who have already arrived, um, we're pleased to see that people from all over the world have joined us today. Uh, some people are still joining the webinar, so we're just going to wait for one more minute for people to arrive. So just hang on the line and wait until we get started. Very warm welcome again uh, to the third webinar in the Red Plus Monitoring and Measuring, Reporting and Verification Training the Trainers series. My name is Sarah Carter and I'm representing Goffsey Gold and Wageningen University, two of the organizing partners. This webinar series has been sponsored by the World Bank Forest Carbon Partnership Facility with support from other partners. For more information on the webinar series and for links to the materials which have been discussed in this webinar, please visit the Goffsey Gold webpage link which you can find on this slide. You can also contact me using the email address on the slide. And by the end of the week, the recording of this webinar will be available on the website to watch again. So firstly, some housekeeping information for today. Um, again, we're very glad that people from all over the world have joined us. So um, welcome. This webinar will last for around one and a half hours. I'm going to start with an introduction to the series, and then we'll have pre presentations on two tools related to today's topic, which is analyzing remote sensing data. Following this, we'll have a two-minute break where you can post your questions in the question box. You can find this in the control panel for the webinar, and then our presenters will answer your questions. So to put today's webinar in the con bigger context um, of Red Plus MRV, um, I'm going to show you um, how this webinar fits in with the webinar series. So this slide shows a number of tools and methodologies which, you can help, which can help you to negotiate the Red Plus MRV process. And on this slide, we've added orange numbers which show which webinar covers which topic. So the red compass in the middle of the slide helps users stock take where they are in the Red Plus MRV cycle, and this was the focus of the first webinar. Technical guidance documents are available on the left-hand side of the slide, for example, the Goffsey Gold World Bank training materials, and you can download these materials or watch instructional videos on our website. Also on the left are tools to help design Red Plus programs. The DST, or Decision Support Tool, was introduced in, last, in the last webinar. On the right are the tools related to activity data, um, including those which are the focus of today's webinar. Um, webinar number three. Next week the webinar will be on community-based monitoring number four and then webinar five is by Winrock International on uh, degradation. Webinar six will be a focus on uncertainty analysis again with Boston University and also FAO. And webinar seven will demonstrate CEPAL which is the cloud computing platform and for this, FAO will demonstrate how this tool can manage and analyze data for national forest monitoring systems. There are, of course, a lot more tools and methodologies which are available and which could potentially be incorporated into this schematic, but we chose to focus on the tools which will be presented in this series. So we started our webinar series with the Red Compass, and this is an image from the Red Compass. If you missed this webinar, we'd recommend that you go to our website and watch the video. The Red Compass is the base of our webinar series, and this tool refers to the other tools and methodologies, um, indicating when and for what purpose you can use the tools. So, this slide now shows the activities which um, we're focusing on today, remote sensing observations in particular. Um, so, for those using the Red Compass, then your progress on this topic can be put into this part of the tool. So now I'm delighted to introduce our three speakers today. Um, we'll start with a presentation from Jan Verbesselt um, and Mathieu de Kuyper from Wageningen University on BFAST, and then Pontus Olofsson from Bo Boston University will give a presentation on BIODA. So, Jan, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So I'll begin with an overview um, on BFAST, the BFAST tool. The BFAST uh, is an open source toolkit that is specifically developed to detect the following types of changes. You can see them here in Landsat images over time, and there's an example of a Landsat image from 1990 here. 
and the following from 2013 that shows changes that have happened. And those are, and I'll show it again, 1990 changes that happened due to, for example, road expansion, agricultural extensions, or uh, gold mining activities close to rivers. And you can see, for example, gold mining activities uh, in the upper left-hand corner or agricultural expansion in the bottom uh, left-hand corner too. That's more recent. And so those are changes you can see from space using Landsat images, Sentinel-2 images, uh, optical data, and also now more recent are actually European sensors. Sentinel-2 is optical, but also Sentinel-1 radar data. And that's a lot of data that ideally needs to be analyzed automatically. And that is the main reason why we have developed the PFAST open source toolbox. So I'll give you here the idea of what we typically do is we analyze all those images to extract the year of deforestation and also period of degradation, for example, so that we know the timing of disturbances or forest changes and also the extent. And we go from satellite data to information and useful information, like for example, the extent of changes and the area of forest change over time. And this bar plot shows you actually forest disturbances, so forest change in dark gray and regrowth in light gray. Now, BFAST is a toolkit for break detection, and it all started with the BFAST package, which is a generic uh, open source toolkit for time series analysis and detecting changes in any kind of time series. Not only time series from satellite data, but also temperature data over time or rainfall data, etc. And over time, we now recently developed the BFAST spatial package, which is a toolbox and a wrapper to make life easy for others to detect changes in satellite data, like Landsat images or Sentinel-2. And a complete overview of the open source tools that are, if they are available can be found via the following website. So the uh, wur.eu change monitor. Now a bit on the ID behind forest change tracking in satellite data. Now imagine you being a security guard watching multiple screens all the time. You ideally do not want to fall asleep and just be there in time when a change happens in one of those screens. Now we wanted to solve this problem by detecting or developing methods that are able to detect changes in those screens automatically. And you can apply that ID to a stack of satellite images. And here you see a stack of satellite images showing change over time. And I'll illustrate that if you zoom in to one pixel with a key time series. And this is an animation, and we'll let it go over this example a few times. And you see uh, NDVI time series, which is a measurement uh, that relates to uh, chlorophyll and greenness of, of forest here in this case over time. And it shows you a time series that starts from early 2000 approximately. And the red data is actually new data that is coming in. And so those are the new observations for just one location uh, extracted from Landsat uh, data, uh, Landsat images. And what you see here is that uh, a model is being fitted on top of the data points that we already have. And that's the blue line. And we use all the green dots to fit the model and do the predictions in time. And that's what we call the monitoring period. And the monitoring period is the period for the red dots. That's the new data. And here, in this case, we actually detect a change when there's a big difference between the blue line, which is the prediction based on the history, and the red dot, which is a recent observation of a forest change, a deforestation event. And that is the ID that, uh, behind BFAST and the BFAST spatial package that we apply spatially on all pixels to detect deforestation, time of change, and also the extent. And that's what you get as a typical output. Um, that's here, and that is shown here for an area in Bolivia, where you see, for example, recent changes being detected in green. Uh, you see the typical fishbone pattern that is picked up, and you can also see 
uh, more old changes. So you go from green to yellow to red, which are changes that actually have happened in 2008. And those are changes detected uh, by the PFAS open source toolkit. Now, more practical, we have uh, the toolkit is available for free. The material is open source, so accessible via the web. And we, it comes together with a tutorial. And the tutorial that shows you step by step how to use it in, for example, we call small code snippets and also explanation in text. And Mathieu, later in this talk, will provide more information about this. Now, the toolkit is developed in a language called R, which is a, a, a scripting language. If you do not know that already, uh, if you do not, uh, and you want to learn more about it, there is also uh, open access tutorials available that we have developed here at Wageningen University and it's, uh, within the context of a geoscripting course. Now, if you go to, to that link, uh, you will find also a whole range of tutorials available and uh, in different lessons that will get you started with R in general and also Python to do spatial analysis that will enable you to handle spatial data like Landsat data or uh, vector files, etc. So these tutorials in different lessons are available for free, open access, and you can follow them step by step to increase your knowledge on how to use R and to, uh, uh, for example, a create a classification, make your own forest map, etc. Then, uh, there is uh, the SAPAL system, uh, which is, stands for System for Earth Observation, Data Access Processing, and Analysis for uh, Land Monitoring, which is a system developed by FAO and Norway, and is a computing platform that can be accessed via the following link. And if you do that, you get something that, uh, like, uh, you get the following page that is shown on the right-hand side. And that system enables you to search geodata, so it enables you fast and easy access to scenes, Landsat scenes, and also Sentinel scenes, and mosaics. You can browse your own data, preview and download your product, process your own data using, uh, for example, the BFAST open source tool. It's, that is implemented and uh, can be used via this open, uh, uh, well, via this computing platform. And key here is that you'll get more info on this SAPAL system in the webinar that will follow on the 13th of June. And also just one aspect here is that there's no real need for high internet speeds if you want to access that platform. And they will mention that again there. So it, if the high internet or your local internet speed does not allow you to download the whole Landsat uh, or Landsat images, you can use this tool to access via the browser Landsat data and do your analysis in there using open source packages that are available. And we work together with FAO these days to make life easy for, uh, for you or for others to use the BFAST toolkits within the SAPAL system. So as a quick summary, uh, we have uh, an overview of the toolkits and that is available at the following webpage, Change Monitor. We have toolkits for change detection, like BFAST and BFAST Spatial, but also for regrowth monitoring, R-growth, data fusion, optical and radar, and also validation uh, data collection, time sync R. And if you want to know the latest and the greatest uh, developments, uh, for example, C and C++ implementations of the BFAST package, you can find that on the bottom link there. Um, the GitHub page where the code and the package is available. And with that, I'd like to pass on uh, the floor and the slides to Mathieu, who will go uh, and talk more about the BFAST practicalities and examples. Thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Uh, in this part, I will go over some of the uh, processing steps and other practicalities uh, for applying BFAST and I will end with some examples of uh, case studies we have done within our group in the Wageningen University. Uh, 
uh, how to get started. So, uh, as Jan already mentioned, there is a GitHub page uh, on Bifa Spatial, uh, which has a very nice overview of the most crucial steps uh, that enable you to uh, run Bifast. There is also a small data set you can download and uh, test it out uh, yourself. Uh, there is also links to the R packages that you need, such as Bifast Spatial itself, but also other pre-processing uh, R packages. Uh, first of all, um, the, the page uh, will uh, guide you through ordering the data, which you can uh, do from the open source USGS Earth Explorer or through the ESPA uh, download interface. Uh, here you see a bit an example of this uh, page uh, with the Landsat uh, 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 pre-processing steps which explains the tool and it gives you also the R source uh, to run it yourself. Um, the BFAST processing steps um, The BFAST uh, processing steps, uh, first of all, when once you have downloaded the data, uh, the process Landsat batch script will uh, enable you to untar all those data layers. Uh, and in the same step, also do the cloud masking and calculate the vegetation in this that you prefer. Um, once that is done, you are with uh, a bunch of uh, separate layers. Of course, depending on, on where is your area of interest uh, in uh, your Landsat scene, it could be at the edge and the Landsat scenes are not exactly the ex uh, same extent. So therefore you need to extend all the scenes to a common extent to enable you to uh, stack all these layers into one time uh, stack. Uh, then you will uh, crop uh, the layers to an area of interest and if you uh, uh, want to do that you can also remove some scenes with a lot of NAs to save processing time. Those scenes could potentially also be affected by uh, cloud shadow. <clears throat> If you further want to clean up this brick, because with a, uh, a very clean brick your uh, BFAST post-processing will uh, be much more straightforward, you can also remove uh, outliers, for example when you use NDVI you can uh, mask out negative NDVI values. Um, with the Landsat 7 data there is also the, the issue with the SLC stripes and when they coincide with uh, clouds you get the following outliers along these clouds. Um, to get rid of this problem you can use the area sieve package uh, because these outliers can both be positive or negative and basically what this package does is to remove any a uh, lump of pixels that are isolated, so you can uh, define yourself how much those are, uh, but the default is five uh, pixels together in case of the Landsat data. And then finally you can uh, break the layers and if you have multiple scenes you can mosaic or merge the layers. So then you are uh, able to run the actual Bifa spatial, um, uh, which has uh, uh, various arguments and then here uh, you can see an example where the monitoring period is moving and there is a break detected at the end of uh, 2012. Please note also the magnitudes uh, below, uh, so over here. Um, so they are negative in case of uh, deforestation or a forest disturbance. Uh, then to the post-processing. Um, first of all, you want to select the baseline non-forest mask. Uh, 
that depends on when you start your monitoring time because basically you are not interested in changes that happen before you start your monitoring uh, period. Uh, although uh, um, you can speed up the BFAS processing doing that beforehand, uh, we recommend to do that afterwards in case you need to do changes on your non-forest mask you can uh, easily do that without rerunning the whole BFAST algorithm. Uh, then we come to the calibration and validation uh, of the data. The calibration uh, is done based on the magnitudes because of course you can also have positive magnitudes and if you are looking at deforestation um, uh, you want to filter those ones out. So basically, uh, depending on your uh, sampling strategy, you can uh, maybe randomly select pixels and then uh, through the TimeSync uh, R script developed by Ben de Vries, you can find it on the link here on the left. Um, you can uh, go through your Landsat archive for this specific pixel and look if there was indeed a change or not then you will end up with uh, a matrix uh, and then you find the optimal between the commission and omission error. The omission errors are uh, changes that have not been captured by BFAST and commission errors are changes that are captured but they are not real changes. Uh, once you have that, you can determine the optimal magnitude threshold which you can apply to uh, come up with your final changed layers. At the end, depending on what you want to do with the data, you can merge the changed layers. So if in year one there is a change, most likely BFAST will also be triggered in year two, but you are only interested in year one, so basically it will uh, use the first BFAST detection per pixel uh, as your final change map as you will see some examples later. Uh, in our group we had, have quite some case studies. Uh, we have several sites in Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, but also in the cloud forest of Ethiopia, in the dry forest of Tanzania, several sites in Brazil and Peru where changes are often uh, a bit larger scale, and in Mexico. I will uh, pinpoint some of the examples later. Um, uh, the great advantage of using BFAST is that per site you can uh, locally tune the arguments within BFAST to um, uh, perform better uh, in a dry uh, wood forest, for example, in comparison with a montane cloud forest as you have in Ethiopia. Uh, here you have uh, an example in Brazil where you can clearly see the fishbone pattern uh, with the ye uh, light yellow colored uh, changes on in the east side. Here's a zoom in so you can see that, that uh, the, the deforestation and the shifting to agriculture is uh, moving towards the east and these changes are uh, normally uh, larger scale. Then another case of which you could use uh, BFAST outputs is in the context of uh, looking at uh, the changes and the regrowth over time to see uh, uh, what is the following land use, uh, uh, what is the fate of, of secondary forest, does this forest uh, reach mature forest again or uh, will it be cut again. So here we do several loops of, of the BFAST uh, deforestation detection and then the regrowth and so on. So to see the dynamics over time. Uh, here is an example of the Kaffa biosphere in Ethiopia uh, where uh, which is the origin uh, of the coffee and where you can see much smaller scale changes uh, ma mainly along the forest edges 
but you can also see that implementations of core forest as in the dark green uh, um, are successful in the sense that uh, hardly any changes are occurring there. Then an example in Peru uh, where we both applied the disturbance and the regrowth. This uh, results you can also find back in the paper of Ben de Vries et al. Uh, as uh, shown on the slide. And in Peru you see uh, large scale clear cuts but also uh, along the rivers you see a lot of examples of mining so in 2004 it was forests in 2012 it got uh, deforested and then in 2013 you still see that uh, there is no regrowth appearing if you look at the curve below you can clearly see the uh, in the vegetation indices that the, in this case the NDMI is dropping and BFAS detects this uh, change. Uh, then some cases where there is um, a disturbance, a regrowth and a redisturbance. Uh, so when you look at the image on the right, uh, on number A, you see on the BFAS uh, curve below that there was a change in 2001. And then uh, there was a regrowth detected in 2004 and then it shifted towards agriculture. That's why the, uh, the seasonal pattern is a bit larger than when you had uh, mature forests, uh, which you can clearly see before 2000. Uh, also in B, you have a change in 2001 and uh, regrowth detected in 2005 and you can see in this case that the forest uh, was further maturing. Some remarks with the regrowth uh, monitoring uh, from experience we know that uh, indices such as NDVI uh, saturate very fast so then it's uh, better to use uh, more sensitive uh, indices more sensitive to moist that uh, uh, slowly uh, have a recovering rate of the indies because with NDVI the uh, regrowth would occur within one year and it could also mistakenly detect uh, agriculture or uh, palm oil. Well NDMI is very slow and you can slowly see the recovery of the forest. Thank you for your interest in our talk. Uh, please note that all the packages uh, are online and if you have questions you can contact uh, Jan Verbesselt or myself. Thank you. Great, thank you um, Jan and Mathieu for those very interesting talks. I'm sure that people are, um, already have lots of questions. We've already seen that people are posting their questions so please continue to do that. Um, throughout the next talk. Um, now I'm pleased to introduce you to Pontus Olofsson from Boston University who's going to give a presentation on Bioda. So Pontus, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Just waiting for the slide here. Oh, there we go. Great. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So I'm going to talk about something we call Bioda, which is which is a collection of mainly existing open source tools. So open source tools that we like to use here at Boston University, that we use in our own research, that we use in teaching. Um, and we have gather that into a virtual machine for EC distribution installation. And then we have written a couple of complementary software. So when we feel that there is a gap, we have um, added software to fill that gap. We have also written educational materials, kind of tutorials or workflows that are um, 
intended to guide practitioners through these various uh, workflows. And I should also mention that all of this is open source. So we try to use as much open source software as we possibly can here at the department. When we teach and when we do our, our own research, we try to stick to open source software. So everything we do, everything we produce is always fully open source and we typically distribute that via GitHub. And everything that Jan presented to is also open source. So BFAS is fully open source. And that, that's an important point to make. Um, and, and the FAO uh, initiatives that were mentioned too, they're also open source. And uh, you know, before I get before I start here talking about, about the software that we have developed, uh, I just want to make this point that as long as everything is open source, there is really no need to not use it all, right? Um, we, 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 will, we should never be in a situation where we are competing. Like, I want you to use my stuff over this stuff or anything like that. If, if we end up in a situation like that, we're failing. Right? Then, then we have done something wrong. Um, and one way to prevent that is to just keep everything open source. Um, so that is something to, to keep in mind throughout these presentations. So, um, first of all, you know, I get a lot of questions about the, 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 the motivation, why we're doing this. So first of all, we, we have be, being university professors, we have research responsibilities and teaching responsibilities. And, and we figured that if we can package all of these tools that we find helpful into a virtual machine, it would just help us do our own research and teaching. So that's one motivator. Another important motivator is to support these capacity building initiatives. So I personally is involved in something called Silva Carbon, which is the capacity building pillar of GFY. And it's also the, the capacity building program of the US government. And it's an interagency uh, initiative. So it spans the USGS, um, the US Geological Survey, the US Forest Service, NASA, um, USAID, the State Department. <clears throat> And, and I work closely with the USGS with funding from USAID. And so I've been involved now for, for many years trying to uh, work with countries, tropical countries, in setting up their national forest monitoring systems. And we have hosted a bunch of, of workshops and various teaching initiatives here at BU and, and at other places as well. And we realized early on that in order for those initiatives to be helpful, we need to provide open source software that the practitioners can take with them back home and distribute and install and pass along and even edit and change the source code if, if they want to do that. Uh, if, if we try to use proprietary software that, that practitioners can't access when they get back to their institutions, um, then it's, it's, it's not worth much, the, the whole the, the, the teaching. So, so this is something we realized early on, that we need to provide software that practitioners can take with them back home and software that allows them to follow these international guidelines that, that me and others have, have come up with. So there are IPCC good practices. I have written a few papers on, on kind of statistics, on area estimation and accuracy assessment. And we have the whole methods and guidance document from, the, from GFY. And if we are writing up these guidance guidelines and, and best practices or good practices, we also need to provide a software that allows practitioners to actually implement and follow and comply with those guidelines. So that's another big motivator of, of providing this, this suite of softwares and educational materials. 
Um, the other motivating factor here is that this is a very rapidly evolving field. Right? We have more data now than what we've ever had in the past. We have better quality data now than what we ever had in the past. So as data is becoming available, so are the, the and, and as, as the data is evolving, so are the tools and the software required to analyze this, this increase in data quality and quantity. And it's my personal experience or opinion that the proprietary software is, is lagging behind. Plus, it's obviously expensive. Um, so that is why we feel it's very important to provide open source solutions. And, and we just saw an example of this with, with Jan Brabessel's work and BFAST. It, it's, it's a very good example of what you can do when data becomes free and available. An algorithm like BFAST wouldn't be possible to run on Landsat data if you have to purchase every single image. Right? It, it's analyzing every single observation over a certain area. And, and the only way you can do that is if you have free access to the data. So, so BFAST is a great example of, of, of a tool or an algorithm or a way to analyze the data that wouldn't have happened had the data not be freely available. And so as the data becomes available, as the quality and the quantity of the data increases, so are the, um, the tools and the software that is required to analyze it. And, and we feel that if we can, the only way to provide practitioners with this, this, these recent advancements is to provide open source solutions. And and then, as I said before, one, of, one, one lesson that we learned is that we need to provide software that is, is easy to distribute and that people can take home and, and uh, that are in line with, with these recent advancements that I just mentioned. So some of the, uh, just a little timeline here of the evolution. So we started out a couple of years ago now, more than five years ago, we started out teaching workshops here at Boston University together with the U.S. Geological Survey. <clears throat> and this was originally a Gofsey Gold initiative. So we have people from the Gofsey Gold regional networks, and, and hopefully some of you are listening in on, 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 this, uh, on this webinar. They came to, uh, well, first they traveled to Sioux Falls, to work with the USGS and, and downloading data. And then they came here to BU to, to analyze that data. And we use proprietary software and realized that this is, this is not an ideal situation. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why we started developing in Biota. Um, and then in 2014, I taught a um, USAID-sponsored workshop in Peru on area estimation and accuracy assessment. And that is the first time that I taught something using solely open source software. But one problem we had was that I wanted, I had the practitioners install QGIS and GDAL and Python and some of these open source tools and softwares that, that we use ourselves. And it was very complicated to have those software communicate with each other to solve all the dependencies and people came with computers and in, in, in um, you know various types of computers and it was a bit of a mess. So we figured out that we need to provide a virtual machine where we have sorted out all of the dependencies. So we won't have any of these issues. And the first time we used that virtual machine was in um, the summer of 2015, we taught one of these Gopsical workshops here at BU, where we used the virtual machine, or, or what we call Biota. And these workshops, again, are they're people from the Gopsical Regional Networks. It's originally funded by NASA via the START uh, organization in, in DC. And that was a successful solution. It worked 
very well, and we provided all the practitioners with a, with a little USB stick that had all the software they could take it back home with them. And then we realized there is really no need to fly people here to BU. It's much cheaper and more efficient if me and others fly to other countries and, and we can do, we can have these workshops there instead. And in 2015, I also started using this in some of the courses that I teach here at Boston University. And then since then, we've been teaching various workshops in countries using, using BIOTA. Um, I taught one in Vietnam just a couple of weeks ago, a two-week course in Vietnam. Um, and so I've taught a couple of workshops in, in Southeast Asia. Eric Bullock, a colleague of mine here at BU, he taught workshops in Peru on area estimation and accuracy assessment. And he also taught, that it's not listed here, he also taught a few workshops in Africa, I think, uh, but I can't remember exactly where that was. So that's kind of where we are right now, that, that we have this virtual machine. We, we, we have successfully used it in various teaching initiatives and efforts around the world, and, and we'll, we'll continue doing that. Um, so just to go back to, to the motivation again, because I think that is important, and, and the evolution behind this. So again, I think all of this, everything that we're talking about here is rooted in this increase in data availability. And that is mainly a result of the U.S. government opening up the Landsat archive. So as, as you're all aware of, in, in 2008, 2009, the U.S. government made the Landsat archive fully open source and, and open to the public. And at the same time, they announced that Landsat 8 will be also free and, and, and public. Um, and what might not be as known is that the U.S. government, or the USGS in particular, they're collecting data from around the world. So you have Landsat, foreign Landsat receiving stations in various places, in various countries around the world. And the USGS is, is, is collecting the data from these foreign receiving stations and processing it and adding it to the Landsat archive. It is called LGAC. Uh, the Landsat Global Archive Consolidation Mission or something like that. Um, so the Landsat Archive is growing both front and back. So you have new data being added as Landsat 8 and Landsat 7 are still operating, and you have old data being added to the archive um, via the LGAC mission. We also, of course, have the Sentinel-2 data that is that is they also, ESA also has an uh, open source data policy there. And, and there are now initiatives of, of mirroring the, the, the Sentinel-2 data and, 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 and making it more compatible with the Landsat data. Plus, we have a whole bunch of other sensor data, a lot of high resolution data since the 2000s, the beginning of 2000, we have a lot, a lot of high resolution data, which again is becoming cheaper and, and more available. So we have a massive increase, as I said before, in the quality and quantity of, of, of Earth observation data. So this, in turn, has sparked um, a lot of remote sensing advancements. So now, as Jan was talking about, we can do time series analysis of the land surface. So instead of looking at snapshots five or 10 years apart, like we used to do before the data was free, we can now download all the data acquired for a certain pixel, and we analyze that time series, um, which is a very powerful approach to studying how the land surface is changing. Object-based image analysis has proven very successful and, and powerful when it comes to analyzing high-resolution data. So you first identify objects in the imagery, and then you try to analyze that rather than individual pixels. And this is especially powerful with high-resolution data because uh, objects such as trees are made up of individual pixels. And then with the Red Plus and, and UNF Triple C, there is a new focus on statistical inference. Um, and I'm going to give a, a presentation or a talk uh, later on 
I don't know exactly when, but maybe in a couple of weeks about that. Um, so we have all of these advancements, time series analysis, object-based image analysis, statistical inference, and, and many others. And what we want here is for this to somehow trickle down to, to countries where this is really needed. Countries that need to set up a forest monitoring system and report rates of, of, of land change, of deforestation. Right? And, and um, there's a lot of initiatives, Silver Carbon, NASA, FAO, GOPC Gold, and others are helping with that. And, but we feel that in order for this to happen, in order for these advancements to trickle down to countries, there needs to be some form of software mechanism that makes that happen. And this is another important motivation of why we, we try to develop BIOTA. Right. We have a free and open source software that is tries to take all of these advancements and package them into an open source solution that we can provide to countries and use within these capacity building initiatives funded by Silva Carbon and NASA and others. And of course, there is there is there is a two way system here. What we develop is also informed by the needs of the country. So a good example are statistical inference. This is something where guidance and and and, and software and recommendations are needed. Um, you have the IPCC good practices guidelines stipulating that things need to be unbiased, they need to quantify uncertainty, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. Um, so we're trying to provide the educational material and the software required to, to do exactly that. So you know, what is this? We call this BIOTA, Boston Education Earth Observation Data Analysis. It's a catchy name um, that we came up with for people to remember this. And what it is really, it's, an, it, it's mainly existing open source tools, third-party open source tools that we haven't developed. You know, we use QJS, for example, as our main graphical user interface. Um, a lot of the tools are, and, and QJS itself, is based on GDAL. And, and a lot of our own implementations are, are GDAL and, and Python implementations. And we then have a, a bunch of educational materials, which is almost like lab instructions. You know, click on this button, click on this button to, to achieve a certain result. And, and the philosophy here is that we try to use as much existing tools as possible, and we, we try to limit our own implementation. You know, this is a rather unfunded issue. We don't really have any direct funding to do any of this. So we don't have the time to, to sit around and, and writing software and, and, and writing our own implementations. So we're trying to use as much of the existing tools as possible. And with QJS, for example, we like it because we can, we can, uh, we can make changes to it. And we can write plugins and, and we can use that as, as our graphical user interface rather than trying to build our own. And then the educational material is divided up into modules which are in line with these advancements that I mentioned before. So we have one module focused on time series analysis, another one on object-based image analysis. We have a, on just traditional image classification and change detection and accuracy in area estimation and, and so on and so forth. And the technical aspects of this, is, it's, it's that it's, again, it runs as a virtual machine that is something we learned early on, that it, we're much better off we package everything in a virtual machine that has all of the dependencies um, sorted out and, and, and all those things. So, so practitioners don't have to sit and install every single piece of software. So the only software that you really need in order to run the virtual machine is like uh, Oracle VM VirtualBox. You can also just boot it up and use B-Stick if you don't want to install that. And again, a lot of this is based on QJS, GDAL, and Orfeo. So uh, a lot of the algorithms that we use are from the Orfeo toolbox. QJS is our main graphical user interface, and we have kind of baked the Orfeo algorithms into QJS so you can execute them in a graphical user interface. And then um, our own implementations are basically GDAL and, and, and Python. And this all runs in an, in an open source Linux Ubuntu operating system.
and this is a screenshot of, of what it looks like, right? So, so um, again, you get QJS. This is this is where we do our analysis, and this is just an example of one of our own implementations. So, when when we teach our courses here at BU, when we when we have the students collect training data for classifications, we want them to analyze the regions of interest. We want them to analyze and look at the spectral signature of the training data, and there were no such good tool. Um, in any of these softwares. So we built something called ROI tool. I think it's updated now. It's called the ROI Explorer. This is a bit outdated, this screenshot. So this is an example of, of implementations that we add to this to kind of complement it. And, and if you look in the right side of the QJS interface here, you see your favorite processing toolbox. So here you have a bunch of algorithms. Here is the uh, random forest classifier, for example, that we like to use. And 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 then we got a couple of our own scripts here. Sample map. This is to support area estimation. So we try to keep everything in one in one piece of software here. So the different modules. I'm probably running out of time here, but the different modules are are um, divided into kind of workflows. Right? So we have one focus on image pre-processing. Here we have we focus a lot on compositing. Uh, classification, this is just simple image classification using some of these or favorite tools. Then we have object-based image analysis. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Traditional change detection and then time series analysis. This is something very similar to what John was talking about before. And then something that, that has uh, proven useful and a lot of countries are using are the, the, this module for area and accuracy estimation. And, and with all of these modules are a set of educational materials which is pretty detailed instructions for how to, to, to just implement this, right? So you can see here, um, sorry, my phone rang here. Um, so looking at the time series analysis module, so at here at Boston University we developed an algorithm called CCDC, which stands for Continuous Change Detection and Classification, um, just to make everything very complicated here, we have um, a Python implementation of this called JATSUM, which stands for Yet Another Time Series Module, and so Time Series Model, sorry. And this is just one of many approaches for, for uh, analyzing time series of Landsat data. And it's very similar to BFAS. And it's, it's based on kind of the same, the same concept here. Uh, one difference is that it's using all the spectral bands to predict future observations. And if you want to know more about this, there are several articles, mainly remote sensing environment, describing the algorithm itself and the usage of the algorithm. Um, but this is an example of what the analysis might look like. We have Landsat observations here, the black dots. We fit a prediction model. We're trying to predict what the land surface would look like, what the land surf what the reflectance from the land surface would look like. And then when the actual observation starts behaving in a different way from this prediction, we break the prediction model and then we fit a new one when we have enough observations. And this prediction proceeds until the observation starts behaving differently than what we predicted. And we break it again and then we initiate a new one. So in this case, we have some form, this is band five, so shortwave infrared reflectance, we have some form of, of pasture here, you know, and then we, we have some form of degradation signal of the pasture, so it's probably being grazed to a point where, you know, it's, it's degraded to a point at around 2006 or so when they can't no longer use it, so they abandon it, and we have forest growing back in this area. I think this is from Vietnam. Uh, we have forest growing back here, on this plot, and we can see then a regrow signal here, and the forest is allowed to regrow until we get a more stable signal. So we can kind of track the activities on the land surface here. 
And CCDC, the last C stands for classification. So then we take the predict the, the coefficients of this prediction model, and together with training data, we classify it using the random forest classifiers. We provide a land cover label for each of these segments here. And because this is continuous, we can introduce kind of transitional labels, such as a regrowing forest or, or a degraded forest. And, you know, we have used this. This is an example of, of mapping uh, conversions between the IPCC land cover categories and, and Colombia. So we're trying to provide support for using this algorithm in Biota. And, and there is certainly support for doing that on, on for, for small time series, for small areas at least. If you want to do process a larger area, it gets a little bit more complicated because you need to host the data somewhere. Uh, but we just wrote up a proposal to NASA where we're trying to take this one step further. And we're trying also to add other algorithms that we find useful, such as BFAST such that you don't have to pick and choose one of these algorithms, but maybe we can, I think the way to do this in the future is that you would actually execute a lot of these different algorithms on the same time series, almost like an ensemble approach. And then you'll, in some form, in some smart way, try to figure out which, which of the algorithms did the best job and you, and you go with that. So, so we are trying to provide better support for more operational usage of, of this algorithm. And that is that is currently underway. And then we have the, the so-called estimation module, estimating the area and accuracy of, of, of activity data or, or land cover change. And a lot of this is rooted in the IPCC, IPCC criteria for greenhouse gas inventory reporting. Just that one inventory should be unbiased and the uncertainty needs to be reduced as far as practicable. So this means two things. No bias means that you need to construct an unbiased estimator. The only way to ensure that something, something is unbiased is to apply what is called an unbiased estimator. And an estimator is just a mathematical formula, formula that you apply to sample data. So you need a sample of reference observations, and then you construct an estimator and you apply that to the sample data to get estimates of the area of deforestation, for example. You can't just, going back to a map like this, uh, and counting all the pixels classified as red, in this case, forest to pastures. That's not going to comply with the IPCC criteria, plus there are classification errors in the map. And uh, and so so that would not comply with IPCC criteria. And sometimes the mapped areas are are very very different from the estimated areas. So you need to construct an unbiased estimator and apply that to sample data. And you need to also quantify the or estimate the confidence interval around those estimates. And me and others have written papers on this, um, a lot of different papers, mainly remote sensing environment, myself, Ron McRoberts, Steve Stamen. And we all came together and provided guidelines on this that we put in the medicine guidance document of GF1. So the other thing we're trying to do with Bioda is to provide practitioners with the software and the educational materials required comply with these guidelines. So this is just a, one of these uh, decision trees from the medicine guidance document of how to estimate activity data. And you end up with a, in a box here, select sampling design statistical estimators. We feel that we're going to provide, if we're going to provide this kind of guidance, we also need to provide the software and the tools required to select the sampling design and construct a statistical estimator. And so that is what we're trying to do here. And we provide support for various forms of sampling designs. And we also have <clears throat> various estimators, um, support for various estimators here. Uh, 
I know I'm going through this pretty quick, but I'm going to give a webinar on just these things later, on just the estimation approaches and how it's being done. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, just want to mention that we got the object-based image analysis here, and we feel that this is something that countries are interested in doing. This is something that countries have found very useful for analyzing the land surface of the country. The problem is that, that some of the proprietary software for doing this is very, very expensive. A, a, a popular software is eCognition, which is powerful software for, for object-based image analysis, but it's very, very expensive and it's not open source. You don't really know what's going on under the hood. And we did this kind of analysis in one of our research projects, and, and, but we used open source software. So we figured that let's try to provide tools and, and guidance for doing this. And we are doing it in QGIS using various algorithms available in the Orfeo toolbox. Um, so we got a module on that too. Um, object-based image analysis of high-resolution data. So the current status of this is that we have something that we feel is working. We're using it in, in capacity building workshops and at in remote sensing courses here at the university. We're working on some of these modules, especially the time series module. It's currently difficult to use that for, for large-scale analysis for large-scale application of, of, of these algorithms. So we want to provide a better solution for that. It's kind of unfunded. We don't really have any, any, any direct funding doing this. Um, and it's being maintained by, by myself and others. Uh, but as I said before, we got a NASA proposal submitted to expand, especially the time series related part, and to get some direct funding for this, and maybe hire somebody that, that is a better programmer and than me and my colleagues. And if you want to know more, we got everything is on GitHub. So github.com forward slash Bioda. That's where we, we keep all of this. But then we got Chris Holden and Paolo Revelo and, and uh, and Eric Bullock, very smart grad students here at the department, and um, and uh, they have a lot of their a lot of these tools. They 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 have developed and and they host them on on their repositories. So um, I leave it at that, and I think I ran a little bit over time. So I'm, I'm I apologize for that. Great, Pontus. Uh, thank you for that very interesting presentation. Um, like I said, we already had a lot of questions, but right now we're just going to give people two minutes. Um, if they want to post their questions um, in the chat box, you can do that. Um, so please write your question and we'll just take two minutes break and then we'll come back and answer all your questions. So thank you everyone uh, for posting your questions. Uh, like I said, we have a lot of questions and I don't think we'll be able to get through them all today, um, but we will do our best. And if you have a burning question which didn't get answered, please feel free to send an email to the address on the slide and we'll try and provide you with an answer. Um, also, the slides will be available as a video. The video of the webinar basically will be available online within the next couple of days. So you can um, watch that video again, and all the links to the relevant software will also be provided on the web website. So first of all, I have a question uh, from Amanda Rodriguez, who's asking Jan Verbesselt, is it possible to implement BFAST in Google Earth Engine? Um, yes. Um, so, Armando, um, there is a possible, well, there is an implementation of BFAST in the Google Earth Engine. I must say it is a light version, so not uh, as functional as the, as the BFAST package that is in R, but a PhD student of our group, Eliakim Hamuniela, 
has implemented uh, BFAST monitor, so the function that we typically use for force change analysis, has implemented that one in the Google Earth Engine. And if you want that, it's open source, freely available also, and you can search for it via the Google mailing list, and there it has been posted. If you do not find us, uh, find the, the implementation, um, just send us an email and we can provide you more info because we are happy to share that. But I must say it is a beta code, so uh, it's not fully functional, uh, but feel free to use it. Okay, great. Thank Thanks, you. Jan, for the answer. Um, and now I have a question for Pontus, and it's a, a question about a bit about how Bioda is actually working. And can you just explain, is it possible to, and Himlal Shrenta is asking this question, is it possible to use Bioda if you have a Windows computer? And just to explain a bit um, how that works quickly. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it's, it's, so it, it runs as a virtual computer on your computer. So the only software that you need to install is Oracle VirtualBox, which is a free software that you can download. If you just Google Oracle VirtualBox, it will be the first hit. So you install that, and then you download the actual virtual machine, and then you run it on your Windows machine. So when we do our workshops, uh, the, the students and, and the participants, they have, it's mainly, uh, Windows computers, but this would run also if you're running a Linux or a Mac operating system. Okay, great. Thanks, Pontus, for clarifying that. Um, and Jan, I also have a, another question for you. Um, and Arseni uh, Zoglov is asking us, um, do you have any uh, normalization for the different Landsat sensors and how do you deal with the different sensors? Is there an algorithm that you use to deal with this? Um, typically as implemented in the BFAST spatial package, and thanks for the question, it's a very good one, um, we do not do any extra normalization if you deal with Landsats 5 and 7, for example. Uh, with 8 and towards Sentinel-2, we have now uh, a package coming uh, that will specifically look at normalizing um, different satellite time series from different satellite sensors like Sentinel-2 and Landsat-7, uh, 8, etc. And that is almost ready and it's based on a few publications that came out from uh, our uh, PhD student from our group, he again, Eliakim Hamunyela. The package will be published soon and it will specifically address normalization by spatial context and it will ideally or at least uh, shown based on a few papers, it actually reduces intersensor differences to enable a denser time series and enable a better uh, space-time change detection of force changes. Um, thanks for the question. Great. Um, thanks for that answer. Um, Macha, we have a question for you. Um, Henrik Filflit is asking us um, that is, is inquiring about NDVI, which saturates too quickly for good regrowth mod monitoring. Are there any other parameters that you can use in the algorithm? Uh, thanks, Hendrik, for your interesting question. Uh, yeah, we normally use the NDMI in this. Uh, at least that's the one we tested the most, uh, because this is based on the swear band, so it's more uh, uh, sensitive to moist. So basically, you can even potentially differentiate between a young forest and uh, mature forest because you can see the trees as a number of layers of leaves above each other and when you have a young forest there is less leaves so uh, less moist and that way uh, this uh, indice is much more uh, suitable uh, for for monitoring regrowth 
as I said before, the NDVI is uh, basically already at the same level as mature forest within a year. So then you also have issues when they plant, for example, palm oil, uh, that this is wrongly captured as actual uh, regrowth of natural forest. Other in and other indies that uh, we are exploring is, for example, the tassel cup wetness or uh, the sphere band on its own. Great, thanks for clarifying that one. Um, Pontus, we have another question for you. Um, can you explain what the difference between the open forest tool from the FAO is with what you have done? Um, and maybe you can also comment on the difficulties that people have in uh, deciding which tool to use. What guide, where can they go to get guidance on this? How can they make the decisions um, more easily on this? Can you perhaps comment on that one, Pontus? Yeah. Uh, so, so first of all, the Open Forest Toolkit is based on GDAL to a large extent. So. It, it's it's at the end of the day, it's the same library of tools that we're using. Um, I think one difference is that we are trying to rely, and this is informed by a lot of the workshops that we've been teaching, that we're trying to um, use a graphical user interface as much as possible. So we're trying to get away from the command line based analysis. Um, just simply because that's what a lot of practitioners want. They rather click in an interface than, than, than write code on a, or write instructions and arguments to a command line. Um, and we're also trying to organize everything around workflow. So we have one workflow focus, one module focused then on how to achieve, for example, an object based image analysis. And then we have another one focused on how to how to construct an estimator for estimation of area with a confidence interval. Um, so it's not just one big collection of, of, of scripts and tools. It, it's, it's focused around, around modules. But I think an important point to be made is that it's all open source. So there's really no no need to not use everything. Right? These are not competitive efforts. They're all um, complementary and, and uh, they're all freely available. Uh, we're trying to provide some guidance when it comes to which tools to use by, by organizing everything around workflows. So if, if you want to um, if, if you want to construct an estimator for unbiased estimation, for example, then, then we have a workflow explaining how to do that exactly. Um, so we're trying not to dump a whole bunch of tools and script on the users, instead providing a, a pretty uh, confined workflow. Uh, I should also say that I, I don't know too much about the Open Forest Toolkit. But 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 again, it, it's based on GDAL. It's it's open source, and uh, there is there is there is no reason to not use that in addition to Biota. Okay, great, Pontus. Thanks for that. Um, we have a question for Jan uh, from Thomas Stans, who's asking. Um, how does CEPAL compare to the Google Earth Engine? And uh, I know we have a, another webinar focusing on CEPAL, so perhaps that will also be covered there, but maybe you can just quickly comment now so that people can uh, know the difference. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Thomas. Uh, just quickly, and again, uh, Eric Lindquist, who is giving the webinar on CEPAL, will probably provide, be able to provide more info. But uh, basically, uh, the SAPAL system is a uh, virtual machine, also Linux, uh, Ubuntu-based, I think, which offers which uh, offers a whole suite of uh, available open source tools. So you can use any kind of uh, R or Python package that is available out uh, out there on the web within SAPAL. Uh, that is uh, one advantage of using SAPAL. 
On the other hand, Google Earth Engine, most of you probably know, has a lot of other examples as uh, uh, advantages. So that's a bit, in in short, uh, what one difference is. There are quite a few, uh, but that's uh, a bit uh, just in a short answer. Maybe a little bit more on the Google Earth Engine. You have Python uh, codes, uh, accessibility via Python codes and JavaScript. It's uh, just a great way to interact with a lot of satellite data in an easy way. Uh, um, what you then need to do is work via functionality and tools, um, functions that are available and active in the Google Earth Engine. And there's a huge user community using that. So it depend a little bit on functions available in there, but you can develop your own there. So that's a bit in short my answer. Hope that helps. And if not, feel free to contact me if you want more info on the differences. Thank you. Great. Thank you for explaining that. Um, we are now running out of time, unfortunately. So um, as I mentioned, if you have questions which weren't answered, feel free to send an email. And like I said, we'll do our best to answer your questions. So many thanks for joining this webinar. Um, the next webinar will be next week, Tuesday, 16th of May at the same time. That's 3 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Um, and this will be on community-based MRV. And we also have, um, after that one, three more webinars um, on the 30th of May, focusing on forest degradation. Then Pontus will be back um, along with a colleague from F the FAO to talk about area and accuracy assessment. And then we'll have a demonstration of the CEPAL from uh, Eric um, on how you can use that for data management and analysis in your national forest monitoring systems. That's the 13th of June. So please sign up on our website. Um, and thanks again for joining and hope to see you next week.